Hello there again. I want to make this pretty fast as a follow-up or add-on to that MPC, MPS, APC, APS video you should have viewed earlier. If you don't know what those acronyms mean, go review them. Here I want to talk about something called the multiplier effect. Now let me kind of explain it to you. I think of it as when you're throwing a rock across the river and it's kind of moving along in a ripple effect. It bounces really high first and then it bounces again and then it bounces again. But as it's moving across that pond or river where you skip that rock, it kind of slows down. When we inject any sort of a stimulus in the economy, it kind of moves the same way. So if we find a way to increase what we call an injection in the economy, first, it's gonna have a big effect, and then it's gonna continue moving throughout the economy so that by the time it settles, we have an overall effect that's bigger than the initial change. I'll give you a very simple example to kind of get you to wrap your mind around it. When I say we have an injection in the economy, I want you to think of the components of GDP. C plus I plus G plus XN. If we increase one of these components, let's say we get consumption to go up. We're not shocked that the GDP increases. Or if we get businesses to invest more. Or the government spends less. The point is, once we move any of these components, we expect GDP to increase. The multiplier, however, is telling you it's going to change by more than the initial amount. So let's say the government decides to spend more. They're going to increase the G. Let's say the government decides to build more schools, increase the infrastructure. When that G increases, GDP is going to increase. That's not shocking. Here's what's happening in the background, though. When the government decides to build more schools, don't they have to hire contractors? Let's say one of these contractors gets the bid to build one of the schools. When the government pays this contractor, what do you think this contractor does with the money? Okay, let's say the government pays the contractor and the contractor pays a plumber that's on the site. What do you think this plumber is going to do with the money that they get? Let's say this plumber goes ahead and buys a pizza. When they buy the pizza, they pay the pizza parlor owner for that pizza. What do you think the pizza parlor owner is going to do with that money? Let's say the pizza parlor owner goes and buys a skateboard. I know this example is weird. I'm making it up on the fly. But I'm hoping you see the pattern. When the pizza parlor owner buys this skateboard from the owner of the skateboard shop, didn't they get a piece of the government spending? Look at how the money is moving throughout the economy. The government spends more to build schools. They hire contractors. These contractors hire tradesmen, for example. These tradesmen will buy goods and services. Who they buy goods and services from will buy even more goods and services. The point is, the one-time injection from the government doesn't just end with the increase in G. It finds its way moving throughout the economy so that by the time it settles, we have a much greater change in the GDP. That's powerful. We're saying one-time injections 
have a multiple effect. That's why we say multiplier. And guess what? It works both ways. If the government spends less, well, guess what? It multiplies and GDP decreases by even more than the initial change. When we're doing policy, we have to take into consideration the multiplier. Now, how do we calculate it? There it is. Change in the real GDP, and we divide it by the initial change in spending. Now, here's another thing or another formula I want you to consider. The multiplier is linked to the marginal propensity to consume and the marginal propensity to save. I'll show you. Let's go back to the example of the government increasing the G by building more schools. When they hire the contractor, suppose that contractor then pays the plumber. Now, let's say when the plumber gets his pay, he doesn't want to consume it. He doesn't buy anything with it. He takes that money and he saves it. What happens to the multiple effect if he doesn't consume? It's dampened. Because remember, initially he bought the skateboard and then the skateboard owner spent some of the money and it kept on moving throughout the economy. Well, if it is the case, when, when we change income, people choose not to spend it, the multiplier is going to be smaller. If when we change income, people choose to save, the multiplier is smaller. This is why the multiplier is represented by 1 divided by the MPS. The bigger the amount of savings rather than consumption, the smaller the multiplier is. I give you income. If you choose to save it in this example, then it's not finding its way back into the economy. It's kind of a bit of a paradox, actually, because we're saying when people save more, the multiplier gets smaller. It doesn't find its way back into the economy. Now, I'm not saying savings is a bad thing, but I'm saying if we want to expand GDP, people saving can actually hurt us. Savings during a recession, when we're trying to expand the economy in the short term, can actually be detrimental. It's what we call a paradox of savings. But if we want long-term sustainable growth, then people should be saving. The point is, the multiplier is affected by these marginal propensities. And here are the formulas to help you remember. Okay? Our next topic will be actually going through quite a bit of policy. I hope that was helpful. Bye-bye.